The Spanish Inquisition is infamous. Long before Monty Python's caricature, history had reached its verdict. A discovery and plain declaration of the Holy Inquisition of Spain, 1567. A court without allegiance to any earthly authority. A bench of monks without appeal. There is nothing else in the world to go beyond them in their most devilish examples of tyranny. Indeed, they do so far exceed all barbarousness. A man cannot more aptly liken them than to that which they most closely resemble, and from whence they proceed. Their sire, Satan himself. Four centuries of condemnation have made the Spanish Inquisition a byword for cruelty, terror and tyranny. But this image is false, a distortion disseminated 400 years ago and accepted ever since. Now a new generation of historians is looking at the Inquisition afresh. Every one of the cases that came before the Spanish Inquisition during its 350 year history had its own file. These files, gathered together from sources such as this library in Salamanca, are being properly studied for the first time. I think our views of the Inquisition had been changed largely by the opening up of the archives of the Inquisition. They had everything on tape, as it were, hidden away in their archives. And we can go there, calculate, put it all on computer, and arrive at very firm statistics about its, its activity. And so all of this has opened wide uh, the debate about the Inquisition and has also demolished totally uh, the previous image which all of us had. The files are detailed and exhaustive. The Inquisition kept its activities secret from the outside world but its clerks wrote down every detail in the confidence that their records were for the eyes of the Inquisition only. The huge task of sifting this material previously scattered throughout Spain daunted earlier generations. Systematic analysis is only just beginning, but already a very different version of the Spanish Inquisition can be brought to light. The Spain that gave birth to the Inquisition in the 15th century was barren and isolated on the fringe of Europe, half of its land unproductive, half barely sustaining a meagre living, a monotonous, burning plain. No easy routes, no natural centre, no one leader. Spaniards could only dream of Hispania, the country that had been united during the days of the Roman conquest. All that was to change. On the morning of October the 18th, 1469, Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Aragon, and Isabella, heiress of Castile, were married. Their wedding ended centuries of rivalry between the two Spanish kingdoms and would unite the country. Spain, for so long merely a name on the map, had become a historical fact. The itinerant royal court often convened in the city of Avila, here at the monastery of Santo Tomas, its facade triumphantly incorporating an H for the reunified Hispania. But for Ferdinand and Isabella, there could be no political unity without religious unity. Pressure was exerted on Spain's large Jewish population to convert. Many did. But traditional Christians were suspicious that these conversos were practicing their former religion in secret. Synagogues, such as this one in Toledo, came under scrutiny. In 1480, a new body was appointed to investigate. Entitled the Santo Oficio de la Inquisición, it's better known to us as the Spanish Inquisition. 
The Inquisition's task was to discover heresy, deviation from the true faith. Conversos, accused of continued Jewish worship, could be burnt at the stake. The Inquisition had begun, but the myth had yet to be created. For while these years between 1480 and 1510 were by far the most active in the entire history of the Inquisition, the rest of Europe did not hurry to condemn it. Tenemos eh, noticias muy precisas de embajadores eh, italianos, el embajador de Venecia, el embajador de Francia, el embajador de Florencia, que escriben a los reyes católicos felicitándoles, naturalmente, porque ya, por fin, eh, las tierras de Iberia son tierras de cristiandad. The truth is that the Inquisition was applauded for its persecution of Spain's converted Jews. A new age of Christian unity was said to be dawning. It didn't last. In 1517, the church was split in two by the Reformation. It was the enormous power and wealth of the church that the Protestant reformers made their target. A power and wealth still on display every year in Spain's religious capital, Toledo. Until then, priests had been the unquestioned mediators between God and the sinful world essential to salvation. But the reformers declared that men came to God by faith alone, sola fide. In turmoil, the church went on the offensive. The church's champion, defender of the faith, was Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. As leader of the Habsburg dynasty, he also commanded the most powerful armies in Europe. But Charles was more than just a Habsburg. As Ferdinand's grandson, he ascended to the throne of Spain, putting that country at the forefront of the defense of the faith. At the Battle of Mühlberg in 1547, his enemies were virtually annihilated. Routed on the battlefield, the reformers attacked elsewhere. Where the church had the sword, the reformers had the printing press. It was no coincidence that printing was invented and spread fastest in the countries most sympathetic to the Reformation, the German states, England and the Low Countries, where this press in Antwerp still survives. With their new technology, the Protestants could fight a different kind of war. For the first time, it was possible to wage a real propaganda campaign. This is what the enemies of the Spanish Habsburgs did, very skillfully. The Spanish monarchy was unable to counteract that. They fought in the military domain and not in the propaganda uh, domain. And they felt that that was an unfair way of waging a war. That was not proper of gentlemen. Gentlemen fought with weapons, not with leaflets, not with ideas. This scum of barbarians, this mongrel generation, Spain, is and ever hath been the sink, the puddle and filthy heap of the most loathsome, infected and slavish people that ever lived. Their more than tigerish cruelty, their lustful and inhumane deflowering of their matrons, wives and daughters, their matchless and sodomitical ravishings of young boys, which these demi-barbarian Spaniards have committed. Within a year of the Battle of Mühlberg, a stream of anti-Spanish invective began to pour off the printing presses of the Reformation. But the polemic needed a focus. It found one in the body expressly designed to uphold the Catholic faith, the Inquisition. A myth was in the making. All the different accusations came together in this document, a discovery and plain declaration of sundry subtle practices of the Holy Inquisition of Spain, printed in 1567. Within the year, it was translated into English, French, Dutch and German. Its author, masquerading as a Protestant victim of the Inquisition, wrote under the pseudonym Montanus.
By identifying with the victim, Montanus brought the supposed horrors of the Spanish Inquisition vividly alive. It is his work which introduced to the world an image of the Inquisition which has persisted ever since. These tormentors are wholly arrayed all over from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet in a suit of canvas, like the apparel that the devils in stage plays do use, and all to this end, to make the poor soul more afraid in body and mind to see one torment him in the likeness of a devil. Montanus contributed decisively to what became known as the Black Legend. The Black Legend is the name given by, by the Spaniards to the image created by their enemies, according to which they were greedy, cruel, um, tyrannical, and especially intolerant in religious terms. And of course, the role played by the Inquisition, especially in intolerance, was crucial. The Inquisition was the cornerstone of this construction. In the early years of the 16th century, to combat the rising tide of religious unorthodoxy, the Pope gave Cardinal Jimenez of Spain leave to move without let or hindrance throughout the land in a reign of violence, terror and torture that makes a smashing film. This was the Spanish Inquisition. Es un experto en derecho y forma parte del conjunto de la administración. Lo del clérigo fanático no es más que producto, producto naturalmente de muchas interpretaciones un tanto sesgadas de la, de la propia historia de la Inquisición. There were career men who uh, didn't even have to be priests. Uh, in the early period of the Inquisition, we have examples of some inquisitors who were not even priests. They were simply lawyers trained at the university. And then they would use the Inquisition merely as a career which could be a stepping stone maybe to another career. This more humdrum reality can be seen in early illustrations of the Inquisition at work. But bureaucrats make boring copy. Montana's version relied on the Gothic drama of hooded fiends. It was not enough for the Inquisitor to be portrayed as a religious fanatic. He had to have a further interest, torture. The abuse of this inquisition is most execrable. If any word shall pass out of the mouth of any, they command him to be taken and put into a horrible prison. Add to the horrors of the prison, the injuries, threats, whippings and scourgings, irons, torches and racks which they there endure. Murdered by long torments, they are whole days together treated more cruelly out of all comparison than if they were in the hangman's hands to be slain all at once. Montanus associated the Inquisition forever with the horrors of the torture chamber. In time, even these stories of repeated cruelty began to pall the propagandists turned to stories of more ingenious sadism. One of them surpassed the others in fiendish ingenuity. Its exterior was a large doll, having the appearance of a beautiful woman. A semicircle was drawn around her, and the person who passed over this fatal mark touched a spring, which caused the diabolical engine to open. It immediately clasped him, and a thousand knives cut him in as many pieces. In fact, the Inquisition uses torture very infrequently. In Valencia, uh, for example, I found that uh, out of over 7,000 cases, uh, only 2% experienced any torture at all, and usually for no more than 15 minutes, and less than 1% uh, suffered repeated torture, in other words, more than once. I found no one suffering torture more than twice. We find, comparing the Inquisition, merely within Spain with other tribunals, that the Inquisition used torture less than other tribunals. 
Uh, and if we compare the Inquisition with tribunals in other countries, we find that the Inquisition has a very clean record in, in, in respect of torture. During the same period in the rest of Europe, hideous physical cruelty was commonplace. In England, you could be executed for damaging shrubs in public gardens. If you returned to Germany from banishment, you could have your eyes gouged out. In France, you could be disemboweled for sheep stealing. The Inquisition used none of these methods. They had a rule book, the Instrucciones, which specified what could and could not be done. Those breaking the rules were sacked. So the Inquisition did not, as alleged, roast their victims' feet or brick them up to languish for all eternity or smash their joints with hammers or flail them on wheels. They never used the Iron Maiden. This Iron Maiden, one of only a few examples to survive, was built in Germany. The Inquisitors didn't ravish their female victims, although a rich and undeniably popular tradition suggests that they did. In fact, the Inquisitorial Torture Chamber of popular myth never existed even though this image was reprinted hundreds of times. And it was not only the use of torture that was falsified. Stories were also fabricated about the gruesome conditions in which prisoners were kept. Ironically, the Inquisition had probably the best jails in Spain. Uh, th this sounds very much like whitewashing, but unfortunately it's true. Uh, let me take a quotation from the Inquisitors in Barcelona in the middle of the 16th century when uh, they were asked to report on the state of their prisons and they said our prisons are full but then they complained to, 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 their, to, their, to their bosses in Madrid uh, we don't know where to send our, our, the leftover prisoners we have we cannot send them to the city jails because the city jails are overcrowded and there they are dying at the rate of 20 a week I have found instances of prisoners in secular uh, criminal courts blaspheming uh, in order to get into the Inquisition prison to escape uh, their, the, the, the uh, maltreatment they received in the secular prison. So, despite the compelling Gothic fictions of Montanus, the evidence leads us to a wholly different conclusion. The Inquisitors were certainly interrogators, but they were restrained interrogators, skeptical about the effectiveness of hardship and torture in bringing heresy to light. By contrast with many other tribunals in Europe, they emerge as almost enlightened. El caso más singular, por ejemplo, es el caso de la brujería. El Tribunal de Santo Oficio fue extraordinariamente benigno con el tema de la brujería, mientras que otras justicias europeas, justicias ordinarias y justicias eclesiásticas, no tuvieron ni mucho menos la misma consideración con este tipo de delitos. La persecución de witches fue una frenzy que se swept through Europa por 300 años, entre 1450 y 1750. En las primeras acusaciones de una fantástica ofensa, sleeping con el devil o bearing sus hijos, las mujeres fueron torturadas o burned a la stake. The depravity of their alleged crimes was cited to justify this brutal response. One tribunal took a different approach. Remember that the inquisitors were university lawyers. And lawyers look for evidence. So when the inquisitors looked for evidence of witchcraft, they said, OK, so this woman has killed a baby. Where is this baby? Uh, how many babies have died? And so on and so forth. And as they went through looking for the evidence, they found no evidence because, of course, witchcraft was we may presume, an imaginary offence. While the rest of Europe reacted with horror, the Spanish Inquisition declared witchcraft a delusion. No one could be tried, let alone burnt for it. But it was the Spanish Inquisition that came to symbolize the ruthless persecution of heresy.
Why? Because by the 1560s, Spain was more than just a power. It was a superpower. Its fitting symbol, the new royal palace, a 16th century pentagon built in the hills above Madrid, El Escorial. This vast structure, comprising miles of marbled corridors, was built by Charles V's son and successor, Philip II. Under Philip, Spain completed its rise within less than a century from isolation and obscurity to the domination of Europe. Philip was at the pinnacle of earthly power, but like his father Charles, he had a higher loyalty. Before suffering the slightest damage to religion in the service of God, I would lose all my estates and a hundred lives if I had them, because I do not wish nor do I desire to be the ruler of heretics. Confronted by such fervor and strength, Spain's enemies changed tack. Their new target would be the king himself. Philip II is an excellent example of the distortions and the creations, very successful creations in, in this case, of the black legend. Philip II was presented as a monster. That's an example of the cruelty of the Spanish race. Hmm? Philip II really, uh, I mean, his policies are perfectly debatable. And personally, I don't like him, but... Um, he was no more of a monster than, say, Henry VIII of England. And Henry VIII, nevertheless, was cleaned up in order to be presented as a fit champion of, the, of Protestantism. Philip took no such trouble with the presentation of his image, believing it beneath his dignity. He paid dearly for it. In 1568, the year after Montanus was published, a chance incident played into the propagandists' hands. The king's son, Don Carlos, died suddenly. Suspicion lighted on Philip, and it was claimed that he had not acted alone. Among the f aspects of the black legend, which became very current in the 16th century onwards, uh, was that the Inquisition had uh, encouraged the king of Spain, Philip II, to kill his own son, to execute his own son, for reasons which, which the king knew best and which the in inquisitors knew best. Uh, for this legend, of course, there's absolutely no uh, evidence whatsoever, or to be even more firm, it is totally false, totally uns unsubstantiated. His son and heir, Don Carlos, was an insane, very problematic teenager who died in an accident. But he became, Don Carlos became something like a champion of freedom and he was the protagonist of many plays and dramas and novels in the 17th and 18th century, the most famous of which was by Schiller, later converted into a beautiful opera, by the way, by Giuseppe Verdi. <laughs> In Verdi's opera, Don Carlos declares before God his allegiance to Flanders, a Habsburg province ruled by his father the king, but with strong Protestant sympathies and by now seeking its independence. <laughs> Defying his monstrous father, Don Carlos is portrayed as a heroic symbol of resistance, his mission to defeat the forces of repression. The next act opens with the king in an agony of doubt. Alone in his chambers at night, he ponders how to punish his errant son. His Christian conscience prevents him taking the most drastic step of all until a visitor persuades him otherwise. The Grand Inquisitor, portrayed as an old blind man, listens as the king pours out his anguish. Then, through his uncompromising arguments, the Inquisitor gradually overcomes the king's reluctance and persuades him to kill his son. Come 
The opera is fiction from start to finish, and the most influential distortion concerns the Inquisition, which can come and go as it pleases, here in Philip's private quarters at El Escorial, a malign spectral presence feared even by the king, and manipulating affairs of state from behind his throne. The death of Don Carlos was a godsend for the mythmakers. In reality, the Inquisition was no more the power behind the throne than the inadequate prince was a heroic martyr. It was not that the Inquisition was without influence. The showpiece displays of its status were grandiose occasions held in the main squares of the cities, such as this one in Madrid. These ceremonies, where heretics were sentenced, were known as acts of faith. But also present were competing power brokers, other church authorities, secular institutions and the aristocracy. All these other institutions are powerful. They all have the ear of the king. Uh, they are competing and conflicting institutions. So the Inquisition has to operate within that framework. Its power, therefore, is constantly being curbed and opposed by the representatives of other institutions equally powerful. It's still possible to capture a sense of the many different power blocks then competing in Spanish society during the Corpus Christi parade in Toledo. Every one of the city's medieval guilds has its own special place in the procession and its own distinctive regalia. Such limitations, however, were as nothing compared to the difficulties encountered by the Inquisition outside the city walls. In 16th century Spain, four out of every five inhabitants lived in the countryside. The Inquisition was divided into 20 tribunals. Each of them had to cover thousands of square miles. Yet each tribunal had no more than two or three inquisitors and a handful of administrative clerks. Contemporary accounts reveal that the inquisitors detested and often shirked their sorties into rural Spain. In winter, the roads were impassable, so visitations often had to be undertaken in the burning heat of summer. A letter from a village priest in 1562 is typical. This village, he wrote, does not know the Holy Inquisition. Era muy difícil controlar las áreas rurales, absolutamente imposible. Y de hecho, cuando lo intentó, se encontró con enormes dificultades. De hecho, podemos decir que durante el siglo XVI y XVII, muchos campesinos castellanos no vieron nunca un inquisidor ni tampoco vieron nunca un auto de fe. Those inquisitors who persevered with visitations to remote villages encountered a level of ignorance that made a mock of their elaborate theological training. Rural life was precarious, often lived under the threat of starvation. The villagers' beliefs were correspondingly primitive. Their only religious certainty was that death awaited them and after death, damnation, where their punishment would be ingenious and eternal.
but the gulf between the Inquisition and rural Spain was even deeper than appeared at first sight. A parish priest's warning betrays the Inquisition's real problem. Let us be very careful tomorrow when the Inquisitor comes here. For the love of God, don't go telling tales about each other or meddle in things touching the Holy Office. Their investigations simply met with a wall of silence. The least credible parts of the myth of the Inquisition, I suppose, are those relating to its image as being a super omnipotent institution capable of controlling the thoughts and minds of people. These inquisitors had no power to control society in the way that many historians have imagined that they had. They had no power, they had no function, they had, didn't have the, the, the tools to do the job. And we, in falsifying the image, have given them the tools which have never existed. Powerless in the country, overshadowed in the city, the real Inquisition is scarcely recognizable from its myth. But it is Verdi's vision which persists of an Inquisition which can command a king and force a subject people to kneel in fear before it. In 1570, two years after the death of Don Carlos, and with Spanish armies occupying much of Europe, the propagandists achieved their greatest coup. A document was circulated which purported to come from the Spanish Inquisition itself, but is now proved a forgery. It alleged that the Inquisition had decided to exterminate entire populations for heresy. This would prove the most damning and durable accusation of all, that the Spanish Inquisition claimed hundreds of thousands, even millions of victims, an allegation which was the opposite of the truth. In 16th century Spain, and dealing only in terms of Protestant heresy, fewer people died for heresy in Spain than in any other Western country. The Inquisition, for example, in the whole of the 16th century, maybe executed something like about uh, 40 or 50 people at the outside in, in the whole of Spain, in the whole of the 16th century, uh, and that includes, of course, the whole of America as well. Whereas in, within a small group of years, which are the reigns, we get at least the execution of 400 English people at the hands of, if we may call it, the English Inquisition, namely the English authorities who are in charge of executing people of the opposing religion. And we get the same figures in other countries. We get the same figures in France, where, admittedly, it was an, a Catholic authority. They executed something in the course of five or six years. They executed something like about 300 people. And so whichever country we look at, we find that the number of people who died for heresy in Spain or for religious persecution of any sort, here I'm including also the conversers, is minimal compared to other countries. So that really, if every country is living in a glass house, none of them could th throw stones because Spain had the cleanest reputation in terms of killing off heretics than any other Western European nation. This conclusion is based on the statistical research currently being conducted in the Inquisition's archives. Indeed, it's now possible on the basis of research done by academics such as Professor Jaime Contreras to arrive at a scientific estimate of the total number of victims of the Spanish Inquisition. Y podemos decir que eh, la actividad procesal del tribunal fue menor, mucho menor que la que anteriormente se había dicho. El número de víctimas del Tribunal del Santo Oficio durante los 350 años de su actividad no, no varió entre los 3.000 y las 5.000 personas. Burning at the stake an image of cruelty associated forever with the Spanish Inquisition. 
but the stake was used to kill heretics in England, France, Germany and Scandinavia as well. Across the whole sweep of early modern Europe, heresy was hunted down and punished. But the virulence with which the other countries of Europe approached their task of burning heretics is a story seldom told. Myth can only be destroyed by fact, and the fact is that between three and five thousand people perished at the hands of the Inquisition. During that same period, as many as 150,000 witches alone were burnt at the stake for heresy in the rest of Europe. The spectacular rise of the Spanish Empire was to be followed by an uneven but inexorable fall. In the 17th century, the flow of gold and silver from the Americas, which had funded the empire, slowed to a trickle. The state plunged repeatedly into bankruptcy, and the Spanish territories in Europe were relinquished one by one. Their armies no longer marched unmatched across Europe. Spain was reverting to the obscurity from which Ferdinand and Isabella had rescued it 250 years before. Derelict once more, Spain was again a backwater in European affairs. And by the 18th century, the Inquisition too was enfeebled, dedicating itself to such heresies as drunkenness and swearing in church. Its career was over, but its myth was indestructible. This legend uh, on the Spanish Inquisition grew, uh, took off and had a life on, on its own. And throughout the centuries, it became more and more divorced from reality. In the 18th century, for instance, when Voltaire uh, was crying against the crimes of the Inquisition, the Inquisition really was killing nobody. There were no burnings or anything like that in the, in the 18th century. And in the 19th century, when the Inquisition disappeared, they hadn't killed anyone uh, for a very long period of time. The Inquisition was eventually wound up in this back street of Madrid. Yet its supposed horrors were being more vividly presented than ever. The Spanish painter Goya depicted its abuses to satirize the corrupt Spanish government of his day. The now defunct Inquisition could be turned by Dostoevsky to criticize the despotic governments of the Tsars in distant Russia. As a myth, 
the Inquisition was becoming a shorthand, not just for religious fanaticism, but for the repression, injustice and terror that the powerful states of a new modern Europe inflicted on their subjects everywhere. And for that incarnation of the myth of the Inquisition, the 20th century had a special use. Uh, are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Yeah, you are sworn. Again, are you now, or have you ever been a member of the Congress? Do you refuse to answer whether or not you are now, have ever been a member of the Communist Party? You can answer the question, yes or no. Comrades, attention, our beloved leader, please. Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? No, no, no.